this talk kind of stemmed from, um, it's a distilled 45 minutes, hopefully I do this in, um, of like 15 years. But it came to me about, uh, say a year ago, because of just kind of the changing landscape in uh, the world I live in, and kind of web apps and, and APIs, HTTP APIs. So that's where this kind of stems from. So I originally this started as just a series of blog posts. So if any of this is at all useful and you want to kind of go more into it, um, my blog has a, a ton of this. So like I said, this is 15 years kind of in 45 minutes. And I'm going to give a kind of a, an example of where this originated from a long time ago uh, and kind of the problem I had. So I just want just to kind of clarify what the problem was that I had. And even though it was 15 years ago, it's still kind of resurging right now from some of the projects I've looked at. Um, so I just want to kind of give you a little bit of backstory here. So um, I was working in a distribution company, and we had multiple warehouses in Canada, eh? Um, and basically, it was a Canadian-only company. We had a lot of, it wasn't direct to consumers, as we had um, sales representatives across Canada. Um, so I had different warehouses, and the software that I primarily worked on uh, when I started there um, was a win like a native Windows.NET application that was this uh, large enough monolith that pretty much did everything for the company except accounting. Um, so this was order processing, this was customer management, kind of the CRM stuff, uh, inventory in the warehouse, uh, shipping, receiving, pretty much everything. Um, and there was also a web app that was written in PHP. Um, this, so this is around, yeah, middle of the 2000s. Um, and, but that PHP app was specifically just for sales, uh, for our outside sales reps throughout the country. So there was some overlap between, I mean, the sales that order entry in the, the Windows app, and then the sales that was in PHP as a web app. And this was really painful because they were essentially the same thing. Um, and every time we had to make changes to sales and to order entry, we had to do it in two code bases. Um, and that proved fairly difficult and time consuming. Um, so we wanted to convert this and use kind of the same language, use uh, .NET still. That way we could create shared projects, use the same assemblies. Um, so we decided, hey, let's convert this to ASP.NET. Um, this is some years afterwards. Uh, that way we can share some assemblies and we're writing it in one place just once. All our tests, everything's going to work. This is going to be wonderful. Or so we thought this was going to be wonderful. Um, so kind of this web app, what it, the, again, the idea was code sharing here, but I'm going to kind of go through what this controller, um, what, like what the typical controllers had. Um, and this is typical of pretty much any app, web app in general, um, is authorization. So this was different between the two, because whether you were internal in the company, you obviously had different roles and permissions. Um, to various other parts of the application than just sales. And if you were in the web app, there was a completely different set of authorization. So this was authorization was ended up kind of not being shared. If you're familiar with ASP.NET, um, the way that you can do authorization is through annotations. They call them attributes uh, on your controller actions, and that's one way of doing it, and that's specific to ASP.NET. Um, data access. So we use MySQL as a back end at that time. Um, and this was not using an ORM or anything. This is just kind of straight ADO.NET, just using the MySQL provider to do direct data access. So this was fairly shared between the two. The schemas were almost identical, um, but there were some issues between the two. Validation. So this is like really superficial stuff. This is just kind of like input validation, not really any domain business logic, just, you know what I mean, really superficial stuff, just input coming in from... Um, the browser or whatever it was actually calling our controllers. Um, and then this was the big one. This is actually what we really wanted to share was our business logic. Um, and even though this actually started in a really nice place, business logic started trickling into the what was supposed to be superficial stuff, and it kind of bled everywhere. Uh, and there ended up being a lot of dependencies on MVC and our framework in the business logic. So this ended up probably... It, turned into a problem trying to use this in multiple places in our, in our Windows app. So it's kind of, um, we had in good intentions of sharing code. Did we ever really get there? Uh, not really. Uh, it ended up 
not really happening at all. We were in no better place than we were when we had the PHP app. So, it was a turd pile. I don't know how else to describe it. It was just mixed responsibilities all over the place. Um, there was separation, and that's kind of like the fact that I grape is kind of it where, I mean, but there were still some little overlaps between certain things um, weren't directly, like there was still coupling between different layers. Um, but we weren't really necessarily thinking about layers. Um, so there was, in our controllers that had, all these responsibilities were in our controllers. Um, and obviously that didn't work out too well for sharing code. So layer everything. Let's go to a layered approach. And the way we wanted to think about it was, let's just make MVC the front end, get rid of all the dependencies everywhere else, and then just have everything segregated so one layer calls the other. Like this is pretty typical layered stuff here. Um, so this is what we started moving towards um, to really get back to the original point, which is to share code. Um, <clears throat> So in theory, the idea was we just have two different front ends. We have MVC as a front end, we have our WinForm app that's a front end, and there's a clear separation between everything in gray there, so that's what would be shared, those assemblies would be shared, and we could deploy our projects separately. There are different solutions. Um, they're completely different code bases, uh, the two blue pieces, and then kind of the gray stuff was all its own separate projects as well. Um, so this, the second time around was, okay, let's, really do this the right way, which is this is what we wanted to try to do. So, I mean, at the end of the day, all we really needed to do, it wasn't about layers per se, it was just about getting framework code, whether that be MVC, whether that be whatever your framework is, it was about getting that, those dependencies and the coupling of that from our code. Were we creating a web app? No, well, yes, we were creating a web app, but we still had our application that had a certain set of functionality, a certain set of use cases and features, and them being uh, coupled and intertwined with framework code um, didn't allow us to move fu our functionality to other front ends, to other things that were really dealing with I.O. for us. So that's really what we need to do. It wasn't really about layers per se, it was just about coupling at the end of the day. So I just wanna go through kind of, um, what some of these layers looked like and what some of these things were. Um, and I still see this today. Um, so this is pre me even reading the book, the DDD book. So this should look pretty similar if you weren't into DDD before this. So for whatever type of, I don't even want to call it entity, not in the DDD sense, but maybe, um, entity as in just something, <laughs> is you'd have this manager. And a manager would have some CRUD operation, some behavior around it. Um, and then if you look at like the ad product, for example, um, it has, um, it takes a parameter of a product. And that really isn't nothing more than just a plain old C-sharp object, a POCO. It has, it's a data bucket. It has no, no behavior in it, all the behaviors here. Um, so. I think, I mean, for the most part, this is pre-understanding behavior, encapsulation, everything. This is the, for all intents and purposes, an anemic domain model. It, you thought you had one, but you didn't really have one because there was something separate dealing with behavior. Um, so these were pretty straightforward. Um, in our data access, this is, this is interesting. So you had basic CRUD operations um, dealing with those same type of POCOs. But the really interesting thing here, and I mean, this is just a made up example, but is all these um, methods that are fetching data. Um, and what would happen ultimately is anytime a developer went in, they had a specific use case of a specific piece of data that they needed, um, they would first look to see if there was a method that kind of filled, fulfilled that request. Um, if it was, maybe they used it. Maybe it wasn't exactly what they needed, so they ended up some, adding some uh, new method that either filtered or returned specific piece of data, not the product as a whole. Maybe they just wanted a, piece, a certain piece of data. And what would happen is this interface would end up being just a straight monstrosity of query methods for the most part. Until at some point, 
um, somebody would say, I have no idea what's going on here. There's so many methods and there's so much overlap that I'm going to create a method that is so generic that it's basically recreating SQL as an API, is essentially what it was doing. Uh, if you're familiar with Link, it was like we were recreating Link um, in some of these methods. So this is what a repository looked like. A lot of fetching data, primarily, and filtering, and how to get information out. Um, so these are the two kind of real problems that we faced. Um, again, this is pre-DDD, so this is, even though there was other issues that DDD would have helped with us with having an actual model, um, these were actually the two real kind of pain points where these two applications weren't identical. I mean, one was just a smaller kind of subset of everything. Um, so we had this big API surface uh, in, these, in these layers, but we could only use some of them in the web app. It's like if you called a certain method in the web app um, from, from MVC, there's no guaranteeing that that, that method would actually work if it ultimately had to hit the database and was trying to hit a table that never even existed it over there. Um, so that was horrific, and that caused a lot of problems. Um, but the one that's going to pertain to the rest of this talk is really it, it's making simple changes um, were painful. Um, they were annoying. They were painful. It bothered me for a really long time, and I could never really put my finger on why it was. It's just one of those things where every day you're kind of working on something. You're like, this sucks. Like, I feel like there's a better way. I know something's wrong, but I can't really put my finger on what it is and how to go about making it better. So with simple changes and having all our discrete layers here is imagine you're making, you're working on a change where you need to add something to the database. And say it's just a single field. It's just something really simple. Right? And I'm jumping into, I have to jump into the, the data access layer, that particular project. I have to find the, the, the data model for it. Then I got to go to the repository and, and also in that folder or find that file, um, make the appropriate changes there to a few different methods. Then I jump over to that product manager. I make the appropriate changes there to keep passing arguments along, keep passing the data, adding new parameters. Then I'm going over to the controller, hopefully just one, maybe. Um, and making the appropriate changes to a bunch of methods there. And then subsequently, all the related views that I need to um, show that piece of information. And this is generally the way I worked. I never really ever worked in one layer. I was generally working through all the layers when I was making changes or even creating something brand new. It's not like I was ever working in one layer. So the way I worked through layers, I thought, well, that's, a, that's really painful to have to keep you know what I mean? Making data bubble through. And just the code navigation of having to do this. Yeah, it's great in Visual Studio sometimes. It's, it's somewhat easy to navigate, but it's still kind of, um, it just didn't feel right because it didn't feel like the, the natural way that I worked. So this is when I kind of discovered CQRS. I think it may be a little odd in the sense that I discovered CQRS before I had a project. You see the URL is called Intro to CQRS. And this is the first diagram it shows. I've created this diagram at early on. Uh, yes, this is CQRS. Um, however, it is also a bunch of other things. This article um, starts off really great and kind of really getting the, the crux of it. And then it starts going into talking about a domain model and the domain model um, kind of emitting events, and then we got some event sourcing there. We have an event store, and those getting published to an event bus. Um, we have a command bus up there as well. And then we have another data um, storage for the read side. And yeah, the left and the right are separated. Writes are separated from reads. But uh, everything else is, has nothing to do with CQRS. Those are completely different things. Whether you want to be using a bus is up to you. You do not need to use a bus to do CQRS. You do not need to be doing event sourcing to do CQRS. You don't even need two different data models to do CQRS. You just want to separate reads and writes. So if I jump back to the, the layer diagram, if you will, and kind of what you would think of that as, um, this is kind of the ridiculous box picture that I think of. I just think of the front end being MVC, having these layers in between, and I want to get rid of those layers, and I want to replace that with CQRS. 
And I just think of it like this. It's, it's my controller is either going to call a command or it's going to call a query. That's it. And especially if you're dealing with web apps, this is actually pretty easy to figure out because if you are using HTTP verbs and you're paying attention to them, you're going to know that get is safe and it's going to be a query. It's going to return data. It's not going to mutate state. And if you're doing a post, put, delete, patch, whatever, that's none safe. Generally, that will be a command. Uh, and you're just going to do one or the other. That's, that's it. Um, it's, it's really just that simple. The, the thing that kind of gets a little bit lost here is then, well, where did all those layers go? Like, how do I, I still obviously want to separate concerns, technical concerns. But what you start doing here is instead of layers being over a bound of context, you start moving these things to, or you can start moving these things to within the unit of a command or a query. So you can deal with authentication on a command level. You can deal with what that business logic is on the command level or in your domain model and call it from your command. Same thing with data access. You decide how data access works within that given unit of a command or a query. And the same thing on the query side. Make that as simple as possible to get out the data that you want. Don't overcomplicate it. You don't need to use repositories here. You can just get to the data however you want to do it to, to, to kind of return this. You don't need to complicate it. Um, so one of the first ways I started um, applying, applying this, applying commands, queries, um, I started using the mediator pattern. And this has happened over my career all the time, which is I start doing something, I start applying some pattern. I have no idea what the name of the pattern is. I'd even, like, I knew it was kind of a pattern, but I didn't really know what the name was. So I was doing this for a little bit. Um, and ultimately what the mediator pattern is, it's just a way to have an object that understands how to communicate, how other objects communicate. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So instead of object A making a call to a method on object B directly, we don't want any part of that. Um, essentially, that is kind of our controller into our domain issue is that I want to separate those things. I don't want my code in that controller. I don't want the controller, object A, to call some my code in object B. So you add it as the middleman, essentially. So what you do is you have object e, A, the caller, um, contact the mediator, tell it what you want to do, and it's the one that kind of relays that message to the appropriate object on the other side. Uh, it understands where it's at, how to construct it, how to call it, etc. So object A knows nothing about it. All you ever really know is the mediator. That's what you're, you're depending on. So what I did with the mediator pattern is I also added the command pattern to it so that the way that I communicate to the mediator and so it understands what to call on the other side is by sending, giving it messages, which essentially are just objects. An object is a message. So create an instance of an object that represents a message, send that to the mediator, it passes it along. If there's something returned like a query, it returns that data back to object A. So some of the code samples I'm going to be showing um, are in .NET. If you're in a different platform, this is all really going to be relevant because you'll kind of get the gist and be able to search for, if you're, if you're interested in this, kind of the equivalent library in, uh, on your platform. Um, so the library I'm going to be using is from Jimmy Bogart, who did a talk yesterday. Um, so hopefully he's not in the room, because that'd be awkward. I, good. Uh, so I'm showing his library. Uh, I've been using it for a few years now. Um, I just gave up writing my own because I was seemingly doing so for project to project to project. And then I finally stumbled upon Jimmy's and I just started using that. So that's the example I'm going to be showing. And then what I'm going to do right now is th some of the code samples I'm going to be showing is I wanted to pick a project um, that's just out there on GitHub. And then this, so this is um, the ASP.NET Core. Um, so the new version of MVC, and this is their music store app. Um, it's just kind of a demo sample. So I wanted to kind of take it um, and kind of convert it using commands and queries so you can kind of get the gist here. So that's kind of the example I'm using. This is also my version of it is, is on my GitHub, and it's through blog posts and stuff. I show all this stuff. So just for some definition here is that the Meteor library, Jimmy's uh, library, it's really request response is ultimately, at the end of the day, what it is. And it's all in process. So there's no queues, there's no but, like nothing, none of that. Everything's in process. And 
the way that you define whether it's a command or a query is really based on whether it returns something. So for me, a query is the same thing as a message. It's the same thing as a request. So I may interchange these words, and you, you'll see some codes that, uh, code that kind of refers to a, maybe a query or a request the same way. So the library itself works exactly how you would think it would. It's, you're going to have a query, which is going to be an object. You're going to pass that object to the med an instance of the mediator that you have, and, and it's subsequently going to construct another class that's going to handle that message and deal with the dependencies that it may have. And then it's going to subsequently pass that query object to that handler, execute it, and then return the results back to the caller. So that's how the library works. So this is the, um, this is the, home, um, the home controller, and this is like the index action. So this is actually this particular screen. So the contents of this action are really dealing with the albums that are listed at the bottom there, like the five albums. Um, that's really the crux of what this action is. So <clears throat> I'll just kind of go through it if people aren't familiar with, um, with C Sharp. This is pretty straightforward stuff, though. Is so it's getting injected uh, a database context, which is an ORM um, entity framework. So it's getting some uh, the database. It's getting an in-memory cache. Um, it's just checking to see whether this data is already in cache. If it's not, go fetch it out with that method called uh, top selling albums. Add it to the cache and then send it on a way back to, uh, back to the view. So that last line there with the return, that's actually doing the view rendering of the HTML of the, the view template. Um, and then passing the, the list of albums in so it can iterate over them and show them in HTML. So this is this act, like this index action. So the, the kind of core idea here is, like I said, is I don't want any of this code mixed with types or any dependency on MVC. So it's really just about identifying what is MVC doing for me, like what's its responsibility, what's it good at, and let it do that and let my code do my stuff, like let's, let's segregate these completely. So it's really just about identifying what it is that this method actually does. So the only thing that I really care about that MVC is doing for me is doing the view rendering. I mean, yeah, it's going to actually, the framework's calling this method, but inside this method, the only thing it's doing for me is the, is the view rendering. So everything else is my code. Why do I have this in here? Um, so let's get this out and let's create a query. So the first thing we need to do on a query is just create a query uh, object. So again, it's just going to be a class that's going to represent, using the command pattern, what the, the properties are going to represent, kind of arguments that we need our, our handler needs. Um, and for this one, there really isn't anything. So this is as simple as it gets, really, which is I'm just creating a class called home. And I'm implementing the interface iRequest, uh, which is a part of the Meteor library. That's where that comes from. And it has a type parameter. And that type parameter just represents what the result should be from whatever the handler is going to be that's going to deal with this thing. And in this case, I want the list of albums at, because that's what the code's doing. So this is, this is pretty simple so far. Um, so the handler. Um, ultimately, that message, that instance of the query that we created, something needs to fulfill this. For every query, you're going to have one handler. Um, so this is going to be the handler that I'm going to create. Same idea. There's just an interface that the mediator library has. It has two type parameters. The first one is just the message, the query that it actually needs to handle. Um, and then the second one is just what the result's going to be. So the constructor I'm doing, I have some dependencies that I'm getting injected. Um, mediator deals with all those things and how it needs to construct them. Um, and what's interesting here is that most of those dependencies were actually originally in our controller. So once I've moved them into here, our controller now really only has a dependency on mediator. Um, so all these dependencies are no longer even in um, our controller. So there's just one method that I have to implement, which is the handle method, and that's the case for every request. Um, and it's just going to take our, our home message, and there's no properties on it, so I don't really need to do anything with it. And so the body of that method is a 100% cut and paste of what was in the controller action, except for the last, the very last return line you in the view. This is a 100% cut and paste. 
So I just kind of truncated there to fit on one screen, but I cut and paste nothing else. So this is what's going to deal with returning our list of albums. So if we jump back over to our actual controller and back to that index action, this is all that's there now. Like I said, it, there's no more dependencies on a database context or ORM, anything else. All we really have is dependency on the mediator. We're creating a new instance of the home method or the home class. And the view model will be the list of albums that we're getting back. And then we pass that to the view like we were before, which is going to generate all the HTML and return it back to the, uh, to the browser or JavaScript or whatever. So this is kind of just to slim this down is now our controller has no idea about any of All it's aware of is the mediator and our commands and our queries, or in this case, just so far, our, our query. So we really limited now the dependencies in our controller. So on the flip side with a command, uh, same thing. A command's a message, is a request. The only difference for me is that it's going to be a request that just doesn't have a return. Like it's just, it's, there's going to be nothing. It's just going to be void. Um, so again, same kind of thing, just interchanging words here. So this is in the shopping cart controller. Um, and this has a few different things going on. Um, it's fetching out the data from the database about the album that you actually want to add to your shopping cart. It's getting your shopping cart, adding that album, saving those changes to the ORM, doing some wonderful logging, and then doing a redirect to action. So that's going to basically return your um, status code with a location header to the appropriate route. So that's some good stuff there that MVC is doing. So same idea. It's what is MVC actually doing here, and what is my actual code? And there's really three pieces. The ID is from the route, um, and that's an MVC thing, dealing with routing and what the, the route parameters are. So it's going to pass that in for me. Uh, the really interesting one here is that HTTP context. So that is an MVC type that lives in MVC, and I need this to live here. I do not want this bleeding out into my code. So this has got that, that HTTP context needs to stay here. And as I mentioned, the redirect to action, um, that is, that's the one re returning the location header, figuring out where index actually is and what the actual path to that is. So those three pieces of information um, are kind of important for this. So I can go ahead forward and kind of create a command around this. So there's really two pieces of information I need that was in the code, which was the card ID and the album ID. So I'm just going to create a simple class that implements I request. Again, there's no type parameter here because I'm not returning anything. It's just going to do this action. It's going to change the state of the system. Um, so I have a card ID and album ID. They're kind of read-only properties. Makes it immutable. Nobody can change it after the fact once I create it. Um, so this one's a little bit more involved than the home query but because I need some data. But you can kind of, like when you're dealing with the command pattern, you can kind of think about if I had a method, what would the arguments, what would the parameters be to that method? It's essentially wrapped up in this command. So here's what's going to handle that command. Um, same idea. I left out the constructor, but it's just taking a dependency on the, the ORM and the logger. Um, so again, that controller no longer needs those dependencies anymore because I've moved them over to this command handler. Um, same thing. I just need to implement one method, which is handle. And it's going to take that actual um, message. So this, for the most part, is, again, Almost, this one's almost a cut and paste um, of what was in the actual controller. The only difference is um, I'm now using the card ID to get the card information rather than the HTTP context. And the reason for that was when they made this, they, it's just using sessions and it has a session ID. That's how it figures out what the card is. Um, so I'm using a card ID that was available in this method already. So this is how I'm now getting what the actual card is without using anything from uh, MVC. So again, almost a complete cut and paste for the most part. If I jump back over to the controller, again, none of that code needs to be there anymore. So all I'm really doing is getting the card ID from the HTTP context. I can make an instance of the add to cart, passing that information, the card ID and the album that we're trying to add. Um, and again, there's no return. So um, this is just kind of doing it um, with async await. Uh, and then it's doing the redirect, which is MVC does well, 
That's what I care about. So that now, again, I've got rid of, I've segregated my code from the actual framework. So what's really interesting is this line in particular about the logging. And when I kind of showed the, the diagram earlier of a command and a query having um, kind of responsibilities layered within them, this is a really good example of it, is you may have a domain model. That's going to be some cross-cutting concern. You're going to be you know, I mean, fetching the data from a, your aggregate route from a repository, doing the appropriate um, calls to behavior on that uh, aggregate, and then potentially doing your, you know, I mean, saving the data. And that all makes sense, but like, does logging need to be in here? Like, is, it, is it the concern of this add to cart handler to do the logging? So when I showed that diagram of having um, the, an individual command have different layers, this is really what I'm talking about, is this type of thing. So Mediator has an idea of behaviors. I mean, for me, it's really just, it's, it's creating a pipeline for your requests to go through. So, I mean, without this concept, you could argue, well, why use the mediator in your controllers when you could just maybe depend on the handler itself? Why would you even bother? It's kind of like at that point, you're kind of feeling like this is almost like a, a service locator or something like that. And who wants that, right? Like, why would you be bothered doing using the mediator if you could just call the handler from your controller? And this is one of the reasons why, is because you can create a pipeline for your request, meaning I can have that, that message go through a series of handlers, uh, preprocessor handlers, which you could have as many as you wanted to. And maybe those preprocessor handlers are the ones doing your authentication. Maybe the ones are the ones doing your kind of um, really light just validation that's kind of, I mean, the surface level stuff, not really domain related. Uh, and then in, with our logging, why couldn't that be a, a post processor and deal with that after the fact, after our actual handler has run? So that's kind of the beauty of this with dealing with Mediator in, in kind of the command pattern is passing that message through a series of handlers and kind of creating a request pipeline. So that's essentially the way it works. You have your caller, it's just doing the same thing as it was before, except the Mediator can figure out, do I have preprocessors? Do I, do I need to call those first? Et cetera. And you can, I mean, some of your preprocessors can maybe, um, I was talking with Eve uh, yesterday about this, and he said that, uh, you know, I mean, a preprocessor could potentially kind of hydrate some of the, the properties on your command that maybe you couldn't fulfill when you created the command in the controller. Um, so Mediator kind of has this baked in um, with their behaviors. Um, and there's a type that's actually created called the, um, the interface I request post processor. And again, this will happen after our actual handler is run. So it's got two type parameters, uh, just the thing that the message that you actually want to accept. And because we don't actually have a response for add to cart, um, we're just actually taking a unit, which is just a uh, basically like a blank value essentially in, in Mediator. Um, so same thing, this constructor now has the I logger as a dependency, and then the process method is the one we had to implement, and it just does the logging. So what's interesting here now is that kind of the same thing we did with the controller is we moved dependencies from the controller, like the database and all that other stuff, and we moved it to the handler. Um, we're doing the same thing now. We just took the logger um, out of the actual command handler and moved it to this post processor. So now our actual handlers there's some single responsibility going on here, and each one of these now has the dependencies relevant to what it actually needs to do. Um, so you can think as like preprocessor, same thing, like validation, authorization, um, kind of post-processors for, for logging, if that's where you want to do it after the fact, potentially mutating the result of a query after the fact, if you wanted to kind of transform it even more. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this. So, What's interesting is once I start getting into um, dealing with commands and queries, I started thinking about why, why do I still do the default of organizing everything by layers or like technical concerns? Like why is every, why is every controller in a controller's folder? Why are models all together? Why are views together? I kind of already felt, I was mentioning the pain of having to make changes. Why are all these things, I don't work that way. I don't work in a layer. I usually work, you know what I mean, um, vertically. 
So that was really interesting to me. And I seen um, a talk by Uncle Bob, and he kind of mentioned this once, which was, if I'm looking at this, he was referring to a Ruby on Rails project, but it's the same thing for, for in .NET um, and ASP.NET, is what, is, like, what does this do? If you can I somewhat see the, uh, the kind of solution explorer on the right. I have all these files open if I was making a change to the shopping cart. Like, what's the functionality? Like, what does this do exactly? Like, what are the features associated to a shopping cart? I mean, this is a trivial example, so you can kind of assume what a shopping cart does. But if you're in a more complex situation here, like, what actually are the use cases? What are the, some of the features? This tells me nothing other than technical layers, that there's, it's, a, it's a web app, I guess. Like, if I had this shopping cart versus um, another application, the structure is completely the same. Like, it, it tells me nothing other than it's a web app which to me is kind of the, a weird way of thinking about it. So I started thinking about, well, if I was having all this pain jumping from file to file to file, we've kind of simplified that a little bit, where now I have commands, command handlers, and I was generally putting these things together. So I was thinking, well, why doesn't, why doesn't everything work that way? Why don't I put things that are related closer together uh, in terms of features rather than um, on, a, on a technical concern? So that's kind of what it was, was putting things together. I have a shopping cart, I have add to cart, remove from cart. Um, you're going to have cross-cutting things, like your, your models that are going to live together. That makes sense. But it still, for me, was about how can, I, how can I put things together that are related, that it makes it easier at a glance. Like, I know what this does now. I know what the functionality is. When I'm jumping around, I need to do something related to viewing a cart. I have two files there. Um, I'm in one folder, I'm in one project, not necessarily all over the place like I was before. So this kind of alleviated the pain of just having to jump through projects and files. So this is actually what it turned into. This may seem absurd to some, um, but I cannot stress how much this has simplified our development with our team, our, just in general, of, of conflicts and I'm code navigation, is literally putting everything in one namespace. Not even one namespace, putting it in one file. I should have kept the line numbers here because this is actually like, uh, maybe like 100, I think it was like 110 lines. And I have the controller here, I have the command here, I have the handler here, I have that logger that, you, that you've seen. Um, I actually have a couple other things here, which is an event, which Mediator also does for notifications, um, and an event handler there as well. Um, so when I'm looking at what, what's all corresponding to when you add something to the cart, I'm going here. And then right alongside this is, um, you know what I mean, potentially the view or if I was in the kind of the view, the view cart side of things. So <clears throat> mentally, this is how I think of it. My top layer is really IO, whether that be MVC, whether that be some other web framework, Whatever the case may be, I want to decouple myself as much as possible. The biggest reason for me right now and why I said like this is a 15 years distilled and why it's more important now than ever for me is because everybody that I'm talking to wants to move to ASP.NET Core. They want to get off the old ASP.NET. And how are you going to go do so if all of that code is intertwined and coupled to the older framework? It's, it's not going to happen easily. Um, and for me, this was really easy to do because I am doing this. I actually moved um, a couple years ago. We moved from using ASP.NET to Nancy, which is a separate um, web framework. It works generally the same way, but that kind of fit our prerogative a little bit more. So that's what we started using, and it was fairly trivial to convert one to the other. Um, and we could do it slowly too. We didn't have to kind of like jump ship and move everything all at once. Um, so having these features, putting things that are related together, um, and, and then having those cross-cutting concerns, like having stuff that's logging your domain model. Yeah, you're still going to have these cross-cutting things that, that branch across features, but, um, but really keeping things together that you can. So for us, like I said, segregating our code from that I.O. Uh, an I.O. for us in our application right now is it's the web. Um, it's separate kind of services that are just looking at queues and processing things independently um, that we kind of have to transform data. They're different services that have to hit outside web services or 
unfortunately, things like EDI um, that we got to transform data and turn into commands. And so those are independent things from what the core is. And we use um, Mediator in some places for this, for that integration boundary, like I'm mentioning. Um, there's kind of other um, libraries similar to it in the .NET space. One of them is called Brighter, um, and it has um, kind of a command dispatcher in the same vein. Um, but it also does stuff out of process as well. And then lastly, feature slices, not layers. We organize code this way. I mean, everything is in its appropriate class. There's responsibilities, but it's just putting those classes close together for organization purposes and not thinking of it uh, from a technical concern. So this isn't just all great and dandy, and there's, there's problems here. Uh, one of them is runtime exceptions. If you have a command and you don't have an appropriate handler, you're not going to find out about that until at runtime, when you actually pass it that, command, uh, that uh, message in, and Mediator blows up saying, I, I don't have a handler for this. So obviously, tests. Um, you write appropriate tests for these things. That kind of solves a problem. I actually toyed with the idea, I should talk to JB about this. I toyed with the idea of creating a Rosalind analyzer to kind of look at the source, look at the code base, and, and find, OK, you have a command or you have a query. You don't have an appropriate handler here. Um, how to deal with that. Um, and Mediator, um, ultimately, the library itself uses a DI container. So that's how it, it ultimately uses that to construct the handler and all its subsequent dependencies. And the same type of thing. You need to make sure that you have your handlers registered, that you have your pre-registers um, registered. So you need tests. Um, it's pretty much that simple. Um, so when I to the very beginning now, when I was showing the diagram, of CQRS and you had queues and you had uh, an event store and you had all these other things, you had two models, it's the enabler. Once you start doing it in process, like something with Mediator, especially if, um, if it's new to you, I suggest starting there. If it's not new to you and this is all like, okay, great, like it's everything I know already, I find it's an easy way to kind of communicate with people that are unfamiliar with the idea because you're not jumping immediately to everything's asynchronous. I have queues all over the place. We have two different models. You don't necessarily need that all the time. And I just think it's a good first step is to start in process. So it enables to start using queues. It enables to start using different data models and different data stores and having different things for your reads and your writes. And then the last one is the biggest thing for me is having dependencies for those handlers, those commands and queries. It's being able to experiment. Because if you, for example, in my logging example, I don't want to use that logger anymore. I'm using log for net, and that thing's, I don't want to use that anymore. I want to use something else. Go ahead and do that. You don't have to do it potentially application-wide or even bound to context-wide. You can start picking handlers that you want to start doing this in. right? If you're using Entity Framework and you want to use Entity Framework Core, Go ahead and do that. They run by side by side. You could decide to make those, those decisions on that individual unit of a command or a query. So that's it. Thanks. So Derek has left a few minutes here that uh, we've got about four or five minutes to ask some questions. So if you have questions for Derek, uh, wait until the microphone gets to you, and then, uh, then we can go ahead and get Derek to address those. Oh, was that clear? <laughs> so I, I d definitely like to get your reaction on this, and you, you probably have a very good reason, but I'm just curious, especially since you're um, talking about migrating from a framework, from one framework to another, um, updating and stuff. Did you um, look at microservices, and what do you think about that for, the, for your application? Yeah, so it's interesting. Dave actually had me um, on Software Engineering Radio. Uh, so Dave has Daily. a podcast, and he was the host of that separate podcast where we were talking about this. And um, when you start doing this um, and you start creating seams, that really bec becomes how you want it hosted and what things are grouped together. So for us, like the... It's kind of like the four plus one, where your deployment view becomes com something completely separate. How I want to package this code 
and deploy it in microservices, I can do that. Like we have kind of, uh, in our application, we have about eight different um, bounded contacts and we deploy some of those together and we deploy some of them separately. But at any given time, I can deploy them all individually. So again, it's an enabler. If I have these things that are just kind of little units, and yeah, they're gonna share some stuff and, and figure out where those boundaries are, but it really kind of really does lend itself to it, um, to having things autonomous and making little units out of these other little units. So I don't know if that made any sense, but it's an easy way to get there, I guess. Thank you.